Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Martin Center Research Seminar. The seminar is hosted and supported by the Martin Center for Architectural and Urban Studies, which is the research arm of the University of Cambridge Department of Architecture. Today, we are delighted to welcome George Souters, an architect and urban designer from Pleasant Places Happy People. We have quite a lively panel today. Um, please join me in welcoming Nicholas Ray, an extremely valuable member of the Cambridge Department of Architecture. And we also welcome John, um, Johanna Musberg, who is currently a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And last but not least, Richard Partington of the Studio Partington in London. So uh, we will begin with a presentation, um, which will last about 14 minutes. And this will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. So same as before, you can type in your questions in the Q&A or you could raise your hands. We would really encourage you to raise your hands so you can, um, you, so we could um, invite you to the panel and then we can see you and then we can talk to you. Um, and if you're watching us from Facebook, please feel free to comment your questions and, they, and then we will bring them to the speaker. So I will hand over to Nick Ray who will introduce the panels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natcha. I, I just want to reinforce uh, the point she made about um, participation because uh, I think that this is a student organized, a wonderfully impressive student organized affair and it's very good for the younger generation to participate fully. Uh, let me just say my, my ticket here for, for speaking is that uh, when I noticed Shud was going to be speaking, I mentioned that to Shen Shen, one of the three organizers, uh, and I've known him since the 1980s when we first external examined. Um, architects interested in housing visiting Amsterdam mostly went to see, I would say, the Borneo Spornberg development, iconic, sometimes uncomfortable buildings. But those who went a little bit further to Java Island were rewarded with an inventive and colorful, extraordinary re reworking the city's housing typology, row houses, long streets, squares, canals. Schurd's going to talk about that project today and two others that absorb its lessons and followed on from that. The Slusa Holman project in near Copenhagen and then Holland Park in Diemen, which is a suburb east of Amsterdam. And I hope you'll have time. I mentioned, asked him to mention, but he won't have illustrations. Uh, you, some of you may know his extraordinary cost project, Castile uh, Lillienhuis in Den Bosch. Um, just say a brief word about the two panelists and then I'll hand over to Shurd. Uh, Johanna is a lecturer in Liverpool, as you've learned. Her collaborative research project with the School of Architecture in Santiago, Chile, How Do We Live, London, Santiago, Shanghai, has been chosen for exhibition in the next Venice Architecture Biennale. So housing typology is close to her concern. Uh, and Richard Partington is a housing architect. Worked, he's been working, uh, for, he's a graduate from Cambridge, working for many years in uh, difficult situations in uh, Belfast and also inventively in North England and York. So we'll come to them after <coughs> Shurd. But first of all, uh, welcome Shurd and take it away. Thank you so much, Nick, for this uh, uh, very good uh, short uh, uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Because we have a little time, I will start right away, not without thanking you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be able to speak on your webinar about uh, our fantastic uh, projects in, in housing. We love to do housing because housing brings us as nearer to inhabitants than any cultural building that you could, could make. So housing is one of the main tasks that uh, the office is working on. Okay, let's uh, start with Java Island right away. Um, yeah, hold on. Next. I called it a trilogy, just like uh, Nick explained, because uh, the next project has learned from the further, for, from the first, and uh, the third learned from the, the, the two first projects. Uh, first, some principles about the way we, uh, our mind is working about these, uh, this type of uh, projects before we start even to do something spe special about them. Yeah. So I, I always start by explaining officials how we uh, came to, to be in a situation where modernist planning uh, uh, was the only model in which uh, cities were expounded. 
in, in the last century. And this is, of course, a model by uh, Walter Gropius, in which he uh, illustrates how bigger buildings uh, give uh, bigger shadow areas and how smaller buildings give smaller shadow areas, and in the end calculating what this might mean for uh, density. And of course, if you have bigger areas between buildings, you can have a lot of cars parked, and that's what exactly what, what has happened in the last century. Uh, but at the same time, it led to a kind of environments for living where people didn't meet. There was lots too much uh, space, uh, parked cars, and so on. There was no reserved place for, for people to meet and to, to join. Thanks. The, the darkest image of this is Ludwig Hilbesheimer. And you can see here also the separation of traffic down in the form of little ants down on, on the road and pedestrians on the, the sixth floor. Uh, and you can imagine that in this scheme, you see the, the rail is under the whole plan and also uh, uh, more uh, functions. And that the, on the sixth floor or so, the pedestrians are, and above that level, people can live. This is an image of a horror atomized society for me. And of course, the Germans are best at this type of illustrations. Next. Le Corbusier is always a more charming illustrator of basically the same idea. This is the famous uh, Plan Voisin that you all know. Um, I have a book on the shelf which, is, uh, which has the title Un Fascisme Francais. In foreign uh, uh, university, uh, as I always advise to do a good translation of it because there you can see what the social or the asocial ideas were behind Plan Voisin. Voisin was uh, 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 an aircraft uh, builder and later uh, a car builder. He made fantastic cars, Le Corbusier had one. Um, but in this scheme, the center of Paris would be destroyed. Two main roads would go through it. Rails were cut out, completely nonsense, old fashioned rubbish, all was to be the car. And you see uh, uh, towers, very high towers, in which the administration and the living of the elite was organized and two thirds of the population of the center of Paris would be banned out. Next. Corp uh, was uh, not very clear in his uh, uh, political preferences. During the war, he would like to be uh, the, the state architect for France. After the war, he made many projects for rebuilding cities. And Colin Rowe uses uh, one of these uh, city reconstruction plans, Sandier, left with Parma, an old fashioned city in the north of uh, Italy. And he compares the two by saying, well, the one is in fact the, the photographic negative of the other. Left, you see buildings, and uh, the footprint of these buildings is only 12%. Right, you see buildings in black also, footprint 50%. The, the, the big difference between the two, in fact, is that the left image shows buildings standing free in free floating space. And in the right picture, you see how buildings surround places and make from the city, in fact, a kind of a collection of rooms and corridors. Uh, left is uh, based on car traffic. Uh, right image is not based on car traffic, but on pedestrians. And we see the, the right picture as one of the favorites in compared to, uh, comparison to the left one. Next picture. In, in the 60s, Jane Jacobs wrote uh, a famous book, uh, 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 Death and Life of Great American Cities, in which she claimed that in fact the interaction and the look from buildings on the public uh, uh, area is very decisive for safety, security, in the public street. And if you uh, draw a line of uh, uh, 80 foot, 20, 25 meters around all the buildings in Sandier, 
like Le Corbusier planned them, you can see that the whole pink area is basically unsafe by that law. And if you look at the right picture, you can see that only the big piazzas in Parma, where anywhere are many people walking around, might become unsafe. But the rest is completely safe. Next. So distance is very important in all our plans. And we use uh, images that Jan Gale produced in uh, Life Between Buildings, in which the left column uh, 80 meters, 50 meters, and 20 meters. In fact, uh, the, the top two are too far away. So we say, in fact, that from 20 or 25 meters, uh, spaces in cities become rooms. And the, the, crit the critical thing there is that on 20 meters, like John Gill says, you can recognize a face. The face becomes recognizable because you can, you can see the one and a half centimeters of a nose bone, and that's a very uh, important part of the human body for face recognition. And on seven and a half meters, you can communicate by face gestures. Uh, on two meters, you can talk, and on 40 centimeters, this talk is quite intimate. So basically, we use the, the, the four last pictures in this, uh, in this uh, series for dimensioning public sp spaces. Next. This is also an illustration on John Gale, which shows how possibly dangerous uh, this uh, top picture is for people who walk there. The, these buildings look at the public uh, uh, walk uh, road, but they are hindered to, to access it because there's a ditch and, and a rail and so on. And so you, you are, you're here in the open, but quite unsafe. And this must be a very unpleasant walk, although it's very modernist Danish environment. And the, the lowest picture is what we, what we prefer above the above one. Next. One of the also lessons, next is serial vision. It's an image by Colin Rowe, uh, 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 Gordon Cullen, uh, in which he shows how, in fact, the pedestrian is rewarded uh, by his walk through different scenes. A scenery, uh, a line of scenery that uh, helps the, uh, the pedestrian to be amused and to walk around and do, to discover new perspectives. Next. Well, that was before we started Java Island. That is what we used and what we, what we knew. And then Java Island. Java Island is from uh, them on the end and to the neck at, at, uh, at the, 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 the front part of the picture is about one kilometer long, 140 meters wide. And it was an island to have big ships load and unload. You see the cranes. You see buildings, storage buildings, and you see a, tra a, a train line in it. And this is how we found it. And the local planners had this as a, as a brief for us. They said, well, this is the length you see. At the right, you can uh, enter by a new bridge. You come at the Rond Point, from where you have a view to the north. From that point, you can look back to the city. Uh, to the left is the long white line you see. And you go to in the direction of the old city, and then with the car you go to the north, uh, and then you have a car traffic on the north. You have a few four blocks with courtyards, and then you have uh, four round towers at the north. You have a stretch of buildings. You have ten towers at the south, and to articulate the end of it, you have a triangular tower. And we said to the local planners, "Yeah." This scheme you could, any, could do anywhere in the world, but how, how specific is this for Amsterdam? Because we believe very much that you should build in the fashion, in, in the way of a, a, a certain place. Um, we call that genius Loki, but that's another story. Okay, next. And when walking on this island, exactly two meters by the controlled water level of the A, which is the river, north of Amsterdam, 
uh, we discovered that the water was an abstraction and you could say that the island is like a hoovercraft. You don't know how high it is above the water. It could be four, it could be three, it could be five meters, you don't know. And my criterion for this is that you have no intention here to feed the ducks. There's no nearness of the water, there's no feeling for the water. Next. And then I discovered a book in my library uh, uh, by Tadehiko Higuchi, uh, Space and Structure in Landscapes. And there he studies why in Japan the, the mountains are sacred. Mount Fuji is the most well known of them. And he starts to do that not on the basis of, uh, uh, of uh, belief, but on the basis of what we experience in mountainous landscapes. And he starts with this scheme by Henry Dreyfus saying that in a, in a, a horizontal landscape, a flat landscape, we look to the horizon, which is zero, and we have a normal light of sight standing, the angle of depression, he calls that. That is 10, 10 degrees under this horizontal line. Next. And then by drawing this line, by looking along this line, we decide what we experience as nearby and what we experience as further away, not nearby. Next. And of course, in Kankayev terrain, you, you have no experience of the horizon. So you lose, in fact, contact with your reference. And so uh, by looking down in the valley and looking up to the, to the mountain, you have no clear idea about the distance in this type of landscape. And at the right of this picture, you see how you stand on the, the corner of a cliff and only the corner of the cliff feels like nearby and the water feels like far away. And that is maybe exactly where uh, I thought, ah, this is, this is the picture that is an illustration of my experience on the edge of the cave. And then we transported these images to the center of Amsterdam. And that was the first time, honestly, that I discovered that Amsterdam is not only having canals and caves and houses, which uh, all of them have their own uh, uh, barcode, the barcode of uh, windows and the barcode of columns or pieces of, uh, of front. Uh, but that also the level differences, the eye level differences in the city center are a big contri contribution to the picturesque experience that you have when you walk there. Here we stand on the beginning of a bridge which goes to the left and we look along the, along the bay, uh, the, 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 the canal, along the houses, uh, over the quay and we see a, a lady in a black shining overcoat. And you, you can see that our eye level is at least one human's length above the lady. And in, in a far away, we see the next bridge climbing up. So we look from up into a kind of valley. And if we follow the lady, uh, we do only 15 steps here. Yeah? Uh, then suddenly we are between the bridges and we have a completely different perspective. We, do, we don't see the water anymore. The, the rhythm of the houses is more important and you see more clearly the next bridge going up. Next. And if you transpose this experience also to the, the, the front of the Amsel River, where the quay is wider, more cars, but the bridges are even higher. You can see here an eye level difference produced by these bridges of three and a half meters. And from these bridges, you have a perfect view over the water of the canal and over the Amstel. And here between the bridges on this stretch of one kilometer long, completely, completely uh, uh, straight, you, you are, the, the whole walk here is broken into a series of valleys and a series of bridges. And when we discovered that, next, we, we said to the planners and to the directors of the city, we said, we want bridges. We want to break the length of uh, the island into smaller pieces because these bridges will give us the possibility to make canals. And these 
canals, these cross canals will give us the possibilities to bring the case in inside the, uh, the islands to a much lower level so that you can step into the little boats and you can feed the ducks. And of course, all the directors of uh, all the directors of uh, the city were against it. But the developer said, well, it cost 12 million guilders at that time. We are ready to pay for it because we think it is an interesting and important that this narrow stretch of land gets a kind of interior. So that is how we got these uh, artificial canals. And you must realize that the whole island is on piling. So you have to cut through the piled case on, the, on both sides of the, the whole length. And then you have to make a, a basin of concrete that you clad with brick. And then you have to put the basin of concrete on piling. And then you open it on both sides and then the water streams through. So the, it's, it's quite a ridiculous operation, you might say, but it gives an enormous feeling of interior to the island. Um, <coughs> the, the other thing that, that uh, uh, we invented here was that if you have this whole length of almost one kilometer long buildings on both sides of the length of the island, um, you could, uh, you could in fact make that feasible and, and uh, attractive to build if you would use a tunnel vault system with a standardized module. And we chose the module of uh, 5 meter 40 because in 5 meter 40 you can make good living rooms, even a combination of living room and a small bedroom. You can park two cars in it. And so it gives a variety of possibilities for housing typologies in 5 meter 40. We bundled the 5 meter 40s in five uh, bays. So we have elements of 27 meters. And each 27 meters, we, uh, we plan to have a different program. So in Amsterdam, we learned that the combination of completely different lifestyles in one building doesn't work so well. So you could imagine that 27 meters, you have one room apartments, 27 meters, you have two room apartments, and 27 meters, you have, for instance, big apartments for families, and they share the public spaces, and they share the street, but their uh, lifestyle is, uh, is uh, uh, concentrated in one of these houses. The idea of the continuation of 540 bays as an idea for a kind of uh, multi interpretation uh, uh, structure comes from uh, John Harbraker. John Harbraker was my professor in Eindhoven, next. And in that time, he had written a book, Supports, an Alternative to Mass Housing, in which he says, in fact, that uh, it is nonsense that we build specific housing types we should make supports which have a long life and on and in these supports, we should make a variety of housing types and this variety could change by the time. So the input, or the, 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 the outfitting package of uh, the support it has a short life and the support has a long life. And that influenced me to bring forward the idea of the endless uh, system of five, 40 bays. Next. So here you see the whole island with the 540 bays uh, in, in uh, grays. And the, the 540 bays were so given in the, in the urban master plan. And then different architects were appointed to, to uh, make the, uh, uh, the interiors, the, the way the, the 540 bays in 27 meters were used. And we added back houses, back houses not only to uh, make the density more high, but uh, also to give uh, the possibility to control these courtyards that you see. Naturally, in the long stretch of uh, housing, all the living room areas, the primary living room areas, will turn themselves to the view be it south, be it north. 
That means that in that situation, you would have only bedrooms uh, uh, addressing the, 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 the areas of the courtyard. In that way, the areas of the courtyard wouldn't be, be controlled by uh, Jane Jacobs' eyes. So we said, by adding small elements, a kind of uh, villa-like elements for stories high, we could have living rooms per little tower too that address and look over the courtyards. You see along the canals, you see smaller canal houses, of course, and at the back of the canal houses, you see an image of gardens, and then you see uh, uh, buildings that are backed to the gardens and make front also to the center of the courtyards, and we call that the palazzi. The palazzi have fronts to the courtyards, and these are the only buildings that not uh, have a view to the water. And by doing this, this all, we have car parking over the whole length of the big structure, in which we have 80% of the, the parking need. So we could make the courtyards free of car traffic, only have a bicycle path through it at the north that runs through the blocks and that is out of the wind, so that is comfortable to, to, to ride there. And of course, the bicycles help also to keep the different courtyards alive and safe. Well, this is a short Java Island. Um, here you see the, how we build up the blocks. You see the length of 27 meter blocks. You see the back houses. You see how we go around the corner to go lower uh, along the canals. You see the small canal houses. You see the canal houses, the gardens, the storage spaces behind the gar gardens, quite, quite conservative. And then you see the the uh, palazzi which address the public space. And you see gates to the south, uh, to the south gate. The north gate is uh, reserved for through going traffic like the bus and the cars to, to come there. There are the big bridges which make this undulating, uh, undulating uh, landscape. On the south we have small bridges for pedestrians and bicycles. There is some car park parking, park car parking there, and that is the pedestrian area where you walk always in the sunshine along the inner harbor. A section, and here you see how we have a kind of neutral uh, ground balance, all the, all the soil we dig out to make the, the, uh, the, the car park, we, we uh, put on top of the middle of the island so that we didn't have to remove a lot of ground which is uh, very costly in the Netherlands. You see the car park, you see the back houses, which are lower than the big buildings, and you see the front of the Palazzi. Next. This is a section in the other direction in which you see the section through the canals. On both sides, the canals have a small, a, a narrow cave, narrow enough to prevent parking on it. Uh, then you see how, uh, the bicycle path climbs up uh, to the top of uh, the inner courtyard. You see the section of the uh, canal houses, sections of the palazzi that address the courtyard, and you see the courtyard. Next. Well, the overall image is like this. For the bigger buildings, we, in, we invited 10 big architects who did all the housing projects along uh, the big water. And for the smaller ones, we invited 20 very young architects had just started their business to do the, the canal houses. You see, this is the South Key where this pedestrian uh, area is. Here you see the canal the section, you see the small bridges for pedestrians and uh, bicycles. And you see, wait you through. And you see the individual uh, houses who, that are four and a half meters wide and uh, who are constructively uh, connected in the sense that the, one of the buildings is always a ladder structure of concrete and uh, the neighbors on both sides hang from this ladder structure 
so the neighbors on both sides have a more free interpretation possible of levels and difference and uh, uh, each other of these uh, separate buildings is a rigid ladder structure. Next. Here you see uh, the courtyard, you see the, uh, the palazzo, you see the function of these uh, back houses who uh, that address the public space, but also in fact uh, stand between the size of the public space and the pedestrian and the enormous buildings on the North Quay. The North Quay buildings are much higher than the South Quay. To get enough sunlight in the, the courtyards, we made the South Quay buildings uh, lower. <coughs> And this is from uh, a higher uh, point looking over the island. And you can see it looks like, uh, it doesn't look like a proper architectural product. It looks like uh, a part of a city that has a long life uh, already behind it. And that's exactly what I like about uh, cities, that there's not one signature, there's not one dominant, dominant language, but there's a multitude of language and expressions. <coughs> yeah. There was an official committee uh, appointed in, in, in Denmark because uh, the local politicians had decided that all the waterfronts of Copenhagen uh, had to be uh, designed and developed. This is the South Harbor of uh, Copenhagen and it is the same uh, for uh, Copenhagen as uh, the Eastern Docklands is for, for Amsterdam. This was the former main harbor but uh, the ships became too big. The, the, uh, the route to this uh, position was too long from the sea so there was a new development of uh, a new harbor further to the north and more directly connected to the sea and this was in fact left over land and you see car wrecker uh, uh, stations, you see uh, energy plants, you see uh, 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 low quality uh, industrial buildings and so on. The, the committee came to Java Island and decided uh, that they would order Java Island for the South Harbor. And when I came there for the first time, I said, well, this is completely different. So uh, you will have a different plan, but if you accept that, I'm ready to, to go for it. Uh, the plan was in the strategy of the Danish or the, the Copenhagen administration linked to the opening of the new bridge to Sweden. By this bridge, new industries, modern industries, would come to Copenhagen, built a head office there, and there was no housing uh, of uh, good quality available for the modern uh, people that would come to it. Copenhagen, just like Amsterdam, is surrounded by a belt of uh, not low quality, but uh, housing of the 20s, the 30s, uh, and, and uh, after the war. But most of this housing is, uh, is quite small, smaller apartments. And so to prevent to have more uh, people uh, coming by car and going by car to their work, uh, they wanted to here to research the possibility to instead of uh, having a house with a garden, to have a house with a, with a boat in front of it. That was in fact our brief. <coughs> The case situation is exactly the same as in, uh, in Amsterdam because these caves are uh, also two meters above water level. Only the water is of a completely different quality. It's completely transparent and you can see the, the, uh, the bottom of, uh, of the water. Uh, it is a sand basis, whereas uh, Amsterdam is in the middle of mud. And uh, <clears throat> that means also that Digging canals here is much easier because you, you don't have to construct, you can only dig and make a kind of a screen and uh, there you are. So in the end we produced a much longer canal, canal area plan here in Copenhagen than we did in Amsterdam. Uh, 
text. <coughs> um, you see here what what my uh, client <coughs> functioning directly under the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen said to me, we will make a plan in three months and the local planners will be kept out. And I hesitated and I said to them, we don't do that because then you get a war afterwards. But he said, no, no, we do that. And we make a big presentation in a big hall and uh, the, the bridge to Sweden will, will go open. And then we present the plan and everyone will be uh, enormously enthusiastic about it. And then directly we will build. Well, we had some wars, I have to admit, but it happened like he said. Next. Here is an illustration of, instead of harmabolic, which means a house with a garden, we now offer a hornabolic, which is a house with a, with a, a boat in front of it. Of course, we looked at the typology of Copenhagen. You have medieval Copenhagen, which you see, which you see here. Next. You have, this is the part that the Dutch did in the seven, end of 17th century. It is the famous Niehaven, formerly a lot of bars for sailors and the prostitution, but now in fact the most popular outgoing area of Copenhagen. Very fanciful, uh, this is north uh, facing south, so all the day it's good weather here, and uh, it is bar after bar, restaurant after restaurant, so this is where you go if you want to dine and wine in Copenhagen. And indeed, in, uh, uh, in the 17th century, the Dutch had uh, helped the king to make Christianshaven with uh, a canal system, small canal system. And in the 18th century, when the French were more fashionable in urban planning, uh, the French were invited to Friedrichstadt. And now, we, in the debate we had with the, with the local architects and planners, why you invite the Dutchman, we made this illustration of three uh, parts in history by explaining that now we do the South Harbor in 2000, and by accident, we are Dutch. But you see the size of the South Harbor in relation to the former two plans, and you see that uh, in fact, we made, uh, because these dark black lines are all canals that we wanted to dig through the, through the sandy uh, uh, earth, sandy ground. Next. And this is the total plan. No, this is not the first plan. This is the second plan we made. The first plan was quite more rectangular. But you see here, uh, the first phase is the lowest uh, part in this drawing where you see a bent canal. And here we invented something that we hadn't done on Java Island. What we did here is we made uh, uh, peripheral blocks, blocks that uh, are square but distorted square. And we aligned these blocks along a K on the south, which we bent. And the bending of this K is related to serial vision but also to sun. If you have a K on the north of the, of the, uh, uh, the uh, section, then the K will always be in the sun. And the whole length of this bent front line, the bent facades on the north of the, of the water, will be sunny. So the, the aspect of this space will always be sunny because what is at the south is in the shadow and because it is uh, 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 convex it is uh, seen short so you see the the length of facade you see in the sun and the short facade you see in shadow and also we made a kind of bend or necks in the in the crossing canals uh, so that um, you cannot look in one go through it you always will see an oblique view of a facade further on. But uh, in the context of uh, public space, here we also uh, try to reduce public space. We said shrinking public space means that the number of people 
per square meter becomes higher. And how we do that? Because uh, we, we try to have these blocks only uh, to give them the possibility to address them on, on one or maybe on two sides, having the other uh, parts of the blocks directly standing in the water. And by doing that, the courtyards of the blocks become the entrance areas for the whole block. And so the community effect of these courtyards become much greater. And uh, the reduction of uh, public space leads to a situation uh, in which people more easily meet because they, they have contact in these limited uh, areas that uh, are left over. And you see, we had a debate about the size of the courtyards, but personally, my best, uh, my best courtyard is the, the one at the far, far right under uh, the picture, uh, because that's the smallest one. These courtyards can be accessed via the, uh, the K, which is always at the south of the block, and at the north they are accessed by bridges that go over the canal. And so there are gates on all sides of the blocks for bridges, but also gates uh, in the, the sides of the blocks where you can park your canoe, your kayak. Next. So this is a smaller type of block, not the smallest. And you, how you, here you see how we also here, we designed the block completely around. Per block, we uh, gave commission to one architect to sort out all the plans of the different apartments where you have your elevators and staircases, where you have your galleries, uh, complete the block, where is the parking, how is the parking under the, under the courtyards. Um, and then we commissioned different architects per color. One architect is, uh, is given the commission to design the facade. The facade said all these, uh, highly modern architects in Denmark, the facade, we are architects! I said, yes, but you only designed the facade and the block is pre-designed pre for you. Well, in the end they did. And uh, we had some, I, at that time I had a Danish speaking uh, 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 woman in my office and she heard what they said uh, outside of my reach of ear and they were not very friendly. But in the, in the end, they all did it, and it became quite good. Next. Here you see one of these blocks um, designed as a complex of different houses and different topologies. Um, and of course, which is decided for, at the right side, you see all these housing. These are duplexes. Uh, the lowest one, one has this uh, uh, access to the canal and the boat. The top one has a fantastic uh, roof terrace. And the other section where you see that the parking is not under the structure of the buildings, because in Denmark, most of the structure is pre, uh, pre, pre, prefabricated concrete. So they find it difficult to make uh, uh, garage uh, buildings under the, under the construction of the housing. So in the end, we came to the conclusion that then uh, the courtyards were the best place to have the, the parking under. Next. And then we made a very simple uh, architectural guidelines for all these highly modern uh, architects about main structure, height, elevations, materialization, color, roof, landscape, corner of buildings where you go from higher buildings uh, on the big water to smaller building on the smaller wa water, uh, 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 special functions on this corner, bridges and functions. And um, the order of the plan was that indeed where you have big water, you make big and higher buildings, where you, you have smaller water, you make them slightly smaller, and you, when you have the smallest water, you get the lowest type of buildings. Next. So it's a very simple plan. Next. And this is what you get by knicking this, uh, these smaller canals. You see the big buildings here in front to the big water. You see that the lowest uh, part of this building is somewhat higher so that on the corners, uh, the structure can contain public functions. Next. 
This is the long stretch of the bent canal where you see the effect of uh, uh, at the left the buildings uh, uh, that are convex in, uh, in shadow and the concave type at the right uh, completely in the sunlight. With the bridges crossing to the, to the blocks at the left and the bridges at length uh, over the, over the, along the long K at the right. Next. The effect of Tadehiko Higuchi, also in, uh, in Copenhagen. Bridges and gates. Courtyards, where there's a lot of uh, communal activity. People, have, people play there, children play there. People have barbecues there. Uh, it's the center of the community. At the right, you see the duplex with the very very thin uh, gallery access. Next. A cafe restaurant at the corner of one of these uh, bridges. Next. The narrow canals. The front of all these uh, very vertical buildings for the duplexes. Okay, and then <clears throat> a man in Amsterdam had uh, seen uh, uh, Sluiseholmen and uh, via via I was invited to come and see him and he had hanged his whole office full of enormous pictures of Sluiseholmen and he said to me well this is the plan we are going to make I said to him well that is very uh, very nice because we just finished Sluiseholmen he said oh yes is that you oh, I didn't know so within one quarter of an hour we had a contract to do a plan what this man was doing, he was buying most of the, the area that you see behind the green block at the front. You see all kinds of office buildings in a rectangular pattern. And you see uh, uh, in front of the rail that runs there from left to right, you see in fact uh, big offices at the end. And this whole area he was buying from uh, German banks uh, with, who at that time had it high in the books, but it was the financial crisis. So he said to me, I buy it not for the square meter price, but for the price per kilo, because I will all destroy and I want to build housing there. And housing was at that moment very risky to do because the market was very low. It was the middle of the financial crisis, but this man was the the only one, in fact, who saw the possibility to do such a thing. Here you see, uh, in the, within the red area, you see the, the plan, the, the plan area that we, we got. And of course, there was uh, underground infrastructure that we uh, needed to keep. There are gas pipes, there is sewage system, and so on. And it costs a lot of money to, uh, to remove or replace that. So we kept that all and we based our plan on the, existing, uh, on the existing underground infrastructure and also on the existing water that was there. Next. So the plan that we made was partly based on Copenhagen. These are the, the blocks that you see in the center in this area where there are two directions are new waterways and narrow canals, 60 meters wide or 20 meters wide. And along the rail that you see at the north, where it says metro spore, there is a lot of noise because of the, the rail and by Dutch law, you need to, to make a kind of a separation, a, a wall that protects the area from, from the noise. So we built, uh, along the rail, we built uh, a line of buildings. And you see that uh, between the infrastructure that is underground and the, the metro, there is a, a little difference of depth. Uh, there's uh, uh, an office building at the far left kept. And so there we start with very undeep blocks and these blocks grow deeper and deeper if you go to the end of the right of the, of the, the drawing. Of course, I learned from Jane Jacobs that at dead end streets towards where the rail is are always a problem area. So I used that knowledge together with the knowledge uh, that was provided by um, um, 
Um, I have to think. Um, uh, hmm? Camillo Sita, sorry, I was to be helped here. Uh, Camillo Sita said that you have two kind of piazzas. You have a piazza which is a, a long stretch with, which has buildings on both sides, which he calls a, a long piazza, but you also have a, a deep piazza. And the deep piazza it always had at the end a high building and that the highest building, the high building at the end should be able to fall down flat in the area in front of it. So using these two theories, we said that we could help the area uh, of the uh, dead end street, the dead end piazza, by building at the end higher buildings, which also make a rhythm uh, to the back of the, uh, of the rail. So here you see a kind of image, how we uh, make, uh, where we make the higher, higher buildings in this whole plan, and where, what part of the plan we make low buildings. You see on, on the lines of long sides, we make higher buildings, and at the end of the, uh, every uh, deeper getting piazzas, we make higher buildings. Good. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can we make sure we finish in just a, Few minutes. Okay, I think you're over your 40 yeah, minutes. We will. Do we want will. some questions yeah, before the yeah, end of the hour? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, fine. You, you see here the scheme of all the blocks. These are more or less distorted square blocks, and the system is like you see in section. And we decided that all these blocks will have six different architectural expressions on each side. So for that, we used six different architects per block who around the block made uh, every side one facade. Next. This is a typical block along the, the rail. The rail would be at the top of this uh, drawing. And you see the complexity of these blocks. And these blocks we did all by ourselves in our office because this, we needed speed and we, need, uh, uh, we needed uh, to address this complexity. Next. The section in which you see that the parking is concentrated under the courtyards in the double parking system. Next. How we work together with the different architects uh, in the other blocks. And this is while building. And you see there's an enormous diversity in color in topology of windows. Every uh, parcel, you might say, artificial part for parcel, as its own uh, height, foot, expression, color, and window type. Next. 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 And this leads to a variety which is very, in my view, very pleasant because it, it gives a kind of very complex uh, system, a very complex image, and people all have their own identity uh, in in their own house next it's quite the opposite of ludwig hilbersheimer in my in my view next waterways access to the water gates and openings in the courtyards to have uh, light coming in next on top of the parking next higher buildings at the end of, uh, of these niches. Next. The order of waterways and caves in a bent way like in uh, Copenhagen. The long sunny side and the short shadowy side. Next. Access to the water. Next. This is it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your patience. Thank you very much. I give you some virtual, virtual clapping. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. I know some people will no doubt have to go at four o'clock, um, but I'm really pleased that you managed to take us through these three examples, learning from each other. Can, can I ask our two panelists, first of all, just a, one question perhaps uh, each. Richard Partington, would you like to start? Um, Nick and Sher, sure, just a very, very, very brief question, really. Um, I visited Java several times, 
And then on the kind of second or third visiting, I began to see that what seemed to be enormously varied and uh, almost chaotic in terms of the variety, and particularly your, you know, your high level view where you were talking about, it, it has the feeling of a city that has uh, you know, accumulated buildings over a period of time. But when you look closely, you begin to see that buildings repeat and window types repeat. And in fact, some of the canal houses appear in four or five different places. So the variety that you've achieved is sort of done to a formula. And uh, my question really then is, is that through the eyes of the master planner? Is that the role of the master planner? And is there a secret to that or a, an approach that's ch changed over time in terms of generating that variety, but it's actually out of repeated elements? What you say, Richard, is true. Um, there, there are a few reasons for it. For instance, canal houses are repeated four times. Yeah. So at each canal uh, house is on one side of the canal and the other side of the canal, and also one time on another canal, two times. So you're right. And that was because the client uh, at one moment said to me, yes, but how can we save some money on all this design? It's 100% economic reason. So in, in the game, between local authorities and developers, uh, we, had to, we had to see uh, how we could compromise. And my experience is that you're a scientific observer of this all. So you, you say, ah, I've seen this type here, the other one. But if you are in a space, you, are, you don't look further than the space. I mean, so that's maybe a weak excuse for, for it because I, I would rather have more variety even, but uh, we came to, uh, for instance, once w one of the clients asked me, yeah, we have a, a type there that you design. Uh, you want now to design another type for a, a similar location. Couldn't we use that type? It would save us money. And I accept it. So I'm, uh, sometimes I'm uh, very weak. <laughs> sure. Thank you for that confession. Can I, can I go straight to Johanna, ask her, and then we maybe will open up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Nick, for, for, for uh, uh, the honor of being on, 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 on this panel, and, and thank you uh, uh, um, for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, should I, I have a, a sort of very wide <laughs> ranging question that probably could bring in some of your some of your other designs as, as well. And it's on sort of my dilemma on, on iconicity and the urban and, and sort of the role of the iconic in, in today's uh, context, because one would find that um, it's increasingly rare to have, um, when it comes to residential architecture, to, to have iconic uh, uh, project that goes beyond becoming a sort of real estate branding a, a device and in today's real estate market more the higher end uh, project tend to be more iconic and my question to you is that can mass housing projects uh, become iconic and and uh, what uh, what role does uh, iconic mass housing projects uh, have in relation to the city and do they have a sort of certain certain scalar limit so this brings in a lot of uh, a question and a lot of your other uh, projects as well. Yeah, thank you for, this is a very uh, complicated question. Uh, and, and no, no, it's a very complicated thing to answer. Um, let me say this, most of the iconic uh, housing projects I don't like at all because they, they, uh, they have an enormous size and by, uh, by making this size a kind of sculpture, a recognizable sculpture, they come uh, a bit inhuman. At best, they could be, become a, a part of nature, artificial nature. Um, I think what I aim at, and I'm criticized highly for this by all the modern uh, high fashion Dutch architects, um, I'm the master of kitsch, they say. Uh, <laughs> but I say uh, architecture ha is, has gone off the rail. 
architecture has has become such a fashionable uh, a fashionable profession where architects try to make something that is never seen before and that's why it becomes iconic i would rather um, base myself on the idea that architecture is a language and that like any other language there's a kind of common basis in it you should recognize some parts of the architecture people should be able to recognize ah there's a door and there's a window the window is like a frame around the person who's standing behind the window it's like a, a painting and so uh, all these elements have in the tradition of uh, of the language of architecture meaning and can communicate because of that and so i say that uh, this uh, this uh, uh, point point of architecture is a language uh, brings me to the vernacular and to the language of a certain area you couldn't you couldn't build uh, uh, in amsterdam for instance i say uh, the same way as you could build in the south of italy you would do it differently you would look for the local or the regional language and try to interpret this language in such a way that the local people could could say ah i recognize this this is this is like we built uh, in the other time and the program is more modern the means are more modern but this is how we recognize where we are so it has to do with regionalism it has to be with vernacular it has to be with language and personally i don't care a bit what other architects say i care for the people who who live there the most people who live somewhere are interested in a safe place for their children to to play uh, a nice apartment or a nice house uh, an area where they feel a kind of belonging and uh, a place where they can read the newspaper and drink their coffee and make love that is the that is the basic needs of people and high architecture i always say not everybody drives in a ferrari you drive a volkswagen golf why wouldn't we make go volkswagen golfs for architecture normal cars normal housing sure thank you very much i i'm anxious to get this to other people but i know people will Will be peeling off but i hope people will remain and if you're happy to continue answering questions if nature allows us to carry on let's yes. hope we can till I, midnight I, Nick, till I, midnight okay i certainly had plenty of questions i wonder whether we shouldn't a little divert to earlier talks which i know you're aware of uh, john ellis spoke earlier um, about his housing in in america uh, there's questions arose about density in yes. particular about whether we should be reconsidering the social ideas uh, and the social and, and i may say that very interesting sort of townscape ideas from camilo city through to uh, you know the golden cullen perspectives you showed all of those things imply sociability and close proximity and now it could be in the face of a virus that changes uh, certainly some people have been saying we have to revise our position that's one area i think of uh, questioning that people might be wanting to address but I, I i don't want to be the only person asking questions so i'd like to to go to others there are several on the q a which you have probably seen and maybe natcha will act as the gatekeeper here because i think she should perhaps choose people uh, you, you, you might know some of the people who are some of them are anonymous the questions but decide which ones to to pick up on but while you're doing that perhaps should if you just perhaps like to address the relations to the uh, issue of distance and social distance and so on yeah john ellis talked about uh, the 20 minute uh, the 20 minute uh, uh, city and i have to say the netherlands is only 20 minute city so uh, and that is because we had uh, a planning uh, a planning philosophy after the second world war that food distribution should be kept and should be organized within the neighborhoods 
it was forbidden to bring food in big halls like the French have done, and like uh, the English also, I think, uh, to bring it outside, to, be, to make it dependent on the car. The idea was that every neighborhood should have its own nearby food distribution so that you could use the bike or walk to your, your, your food store. And that still exists in Holland. So the Netherlands is completely 20 minutes uh, based. And that's a big difference with the problem that John talked about in, in America, of course. That is completely different. And also in France, if I go to France, everything is, let's say, let's say these inner cities are quite dead and, and uh, except for the ones that have a lot of tourism, but the smaller inner cities are completely dead and not lived in anymore. And they're, 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 they're cadavers of what they have been. And uh, les grandes surfaces, like the French say, they have all, all the stores are outside the city, which enormous parking in front of it, and, and everyone use it. <coughs> so the plan of um, Le Corbusier, Le, Le, the voisin plan, was really rolled out in France. France is really based on the car. Okay, so I guess um, if I may ask a few questions that I got um, via emails. So um, my question is, how do you define a pleasant places and how um, and have you taught it in the studio before, in a, an architectural studio before? If so, can you elaborate how you did that? Or if not, can you, how do you plan to do that, to teach the, the concept of the creation of the pleasant place? Um, the strategy we use, in fact, is always that we first design the public space, that we, we, we design first the, the area between the buildings. Uh, if you start not with the building, but you start with the, the area which will be surrounded by buildings, the area gives you the brief about how high about your building should be, what buildings you need to make the, uh, the, 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 uh, the nice space. Uh, so that is the point of departure. And in that way, we, we act completely different from mo most architects who start with buildings. Um, I, after being 10 years an architect, I decided that architecture is, not, is never able to solve a problem of bad planning, of bad urban design. So I decided for myself that I wanted to be more an urban planner and learning from architecture in doing your urban plan and learning from urban planning by doing your architecture is the best way to do our profession, I think. But it's always a matter of how we make public spaces good, what should be the dimension, and in that we base ourselves on this, this uh, this line of images that Jan Gale produced on eye, eye, uh, eye distance in the, uh, in the public space, I think that's very important. And um, Christopher Alexander wrote a lot about this also. And the, the strange thing, it, it, there's so many books uh, which, uh, in which uh, it is advocated to, to think about uh, a pleasant place, the dimensions of a pleasant place, but architects don't care. <laughs> they want to make a building. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, a very interesting question here. Um, in the last plan, um, I saw a very, very few green spaces and very few trees. Um, why did you do this? And I wonder how you make a place more livable without the green. It is, the green is not yet there because the plan is not finished. Although some of the buildings are in use already, for instance, the, uh, the, the trees along the canal side are net, not there. And there's a, a large area where, where you have this wider bend of buildings at the north uh, and the, the east. Um, there is to be a kind of green, uh, a green uh, slope towards uh, the large water with a lot of trees on it. And there will be a park on the south of this whole area. So it's not, it's not finished. We are busy. There will be a lot of green, don't worry.
Okay, thank you very much. And perhaps um, I'm a bit concerned about the time. Maybe we could um, finish off with one last question. Um, For me, you can go on. Is it, <laughs> I'm not. Oh, we actually got another hand raised, so I will invite the person to the panel. And in the meantime, I will read the question. So. Thanks for the impressive lecture. The concept of the reduced public space sounds interesting. Did you mean that the reduced public space could facilitate more social interactions among a small range of neighbors? And what activities did you expect the neighbors to do in these areas to make the place more pleasant? Thank you for this question. I, I think uh, what the neighbors do together is maybe one thing, but the other thing is, uh, the act of meeting in the public street is already very important to build up your, uh, your social network. We know that the frequency in which we meet is decisive for uh, if this meeting becomes a connection. If I meet someone, I, I, I lived for a long time uh, on the Amsterdam Canal, but I lived in the, in the courtyard, so I had no connection with the street. I didn't see people on the street. If you go out of your house and you ha don't have a view on the street, um, you meet another person maybe once in four weeks. Um, and after four weeks, you see him again. And uh, maybe you at first don't recognize him uh, uh, for the first, uh, for the second time. So the, the interval between the meeting and also the, uh, it's very important. And if you reduce the public space, uh, so that, for instance, all the traffic is on one side of the canal and the other side of the canal is only water and facades, then uh, the intensity uh, and the frequency of meeting can be higher. That is my hope. In the courtyards of uh, Java Island and the courtyards of Sluiseholmen, you see enormous activity. In summer, uh, children play there. There are children parties. There are parties for grown-ups with drinks and, and, and uh, snacks. So, uh, there are barbecues. So everything, uh, everything is happening in these courtyards. And these courtyards, of course, are like piazzas because uh, the, the backs of these houses and the fronts of these smaller uh, these smaller towers are addressing these courtyards. So they function really as communal space. Thank you very much. And now can we hear from Gustavo, who have, I have invited to the panel? If you could unmute yourself. I, I, yeah, thank you very much for, for promoting me to the, to the panel. I, I, I wasn't expecting the, the, the one thing I was, um, thinking in relation to the talk, which I found fascinating, really amazing, and very, very interesting. I have visited those projects. Um, but the question that's burning my mind is, um, how do you, do you relate um, those examples of uh, Amsterdam and, uh, and Copenhagen and, and other European examples to the, to the UK, where it's interesting because in the, um, sort of historic context of many, many of the developments in the UK, you don't see the variety. I mean, if you take, for example, the West End of Glasgow or Liverpool or even certain areas in London, many fine developments um, which um, rely on a repetitive um, pattern and, um, and it's equally pleasant. And um, many of the principles that you've mentioned are are absolutely there, you know, in terms of scale, um, etc. So that's just uh, just throwing in a, a slightly different angle, which is, is 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 interesting in terms of how the UK differs from the experience in Europe, and perhaps why we have such a such a difference. Thank you for the question. I, I don't know why, <laughs> but it's true that if you if you make one type uh, which, which has a grain which is acceptable and, and nice, and you repeat it 200 times on a row, you, had, you have at the same time a big scale. So uh, very essential is that uh, if you want, uh, let's say this, 
uh, Amsterdam was built and, and part of uh, Copenhagen was built by citizens. And these citizens built their own house. And the facade that they built was the expression of their dignity or their per persona. And uh, every hundred years, the facade went down. One floor came uh, above and they built a new facade. Um, so this liveliness of different facades, even changing through the, through the centuries, is one aspect of uh, the Northern European city. And I think England has the same tradition. But, uh, and, and, and we do the same that the English do. We see a lot of projects in, in which one type is endlessly repeated, which makes a very dull and impersonal uh, uh, part of uh, city extensions. So I'm not uh, for that. Uh, I think that Adolf Loos in one of his essays uh, described that in fact, um, a city consists of houses and the house in the middle is a bit like the house to the left and a bit like the house to the right. But it has its own expression, but it's part of the whole. Um, and architecture, he says, is for the Palazzi und die Grabdenkmaler. That is what architecture is for. And nowadays we think architecture is for everything. That is a mistake. We should make very simple houses for simple people because they, they want some comfort and they want some pleasant environment and they want some individuality. And the, individu the individuality asks for a, a kind of smaller scale expression in which you can say, I live in that red house on the fourth floor. That's my apartment. That gives a kind of feeling, that's where I, I am, that's where I belong. So this is the agenda for what we try to do. And I'm sure you could do the same in England. There's no reason why you couldn't do it. And for social, uh, let's say, in, in all our projects, uh, although not in, uh, in, in Demon, I have to admit, um, but Java Island, for instance, is 30% social housing. And always I say to a group who comes to visit, I say, who can say me where the, the social housing is? He gets the bottle of Geneva. But I've, I've never given a bottle of Geneva because you cannot see it. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we could end with um, a few comments by the panelists, if you have anything else to add. I think, I think it's a good idea. Should, should we just take in turn to you? Richard, would you like to say something, some return on, 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 the, on the discussion? Oh, I, 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 I think the whole thing, I wish we could go on until 12 because the whole thing is fascinating in the context of how we do things in the UK with, it seems to me, so little ambition. Now, I was going to ask a question about, you know, how on earth do you get somebody to make such a big uh, sort of intervention like building a canal. If we said in our culture that we were going to build a canal because it would make people happy, we would be laughed at. And yet, and yet, <laughs> and yet it was the developer who said, yeah, I think this canal could be quite an interesting thing. So it, it, on the one hand, it's very, it's so stimulating, you know, as a practitioner to hear these discussions. But on the other, uh, and I always felt this when we took politicians from the UK on study tours in, in the Netherlands, for instance, that, that actually what we were witnessing was just a better way of living and that our expectation in the built environment is so impoverished that it's actually mm. very hard for those kinds of discussions to happen. Mm. So it's, it's fantastic to be reinvigorated about thinking what, what could be done to make people happy. Very good. Thank you so much. Johanna, can I, can I suggest you have a return? You have to unmute yourself, Rihanna. Rihanna. Yeah. So I, yeah, I also would have had a, a, a lot of of, of question that uh, 
that um, uh, that your lecture um, and your architecture uh, brings up that I think are very very current uh, uh, in terms of uh, yeah how specific can we get and 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 what ensures that 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 things become adaptable therefore somewhat uh, sustainable and 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 changeable and isn't that also part of uh, creating a pleasant uh, 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 environment on a larger time span so uh, how do we ensure that things are fixed to the extent of being recognizable but not uh, uh, um, yeah does it, but we don't over define them so i think that 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 is 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 this sort of um, wonderfully exciting balance that I am very interested in your position on. If you don't mind <laughs> me asking a, 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 a another a question, and uh, yeah, I mean, amongst <laughs> numerous uh, other ones. <laughs> Should would you like to answer that? I mean, I mean, I could add to that a little bit that, that the Harbrocken that you refer to. Of course, the idea of that framework, which Le Corbusier also in some of the perspectives, Algiers probably suggests that people themselves, as, as indeed in Amsterdam and Copenhagen, they made their own environments. So they would, within some rational frame, be able to express themselves. And yet, perforce, you have had to invite other architects to make facades and to make, as it were, a pseudo, uh, popular uh, arrangement, which has is the best we can do in the circumstances, I imagine. I, ideally, perhaps it would be people themselves expressing themselves with the face they make of their buildings mm. in relation to the spaces that they address. Yeah, um, how we should go further is, of course, uh, in your country also, building will, will become more and more expensive. Craftsmanship is out, not only in your country, in our country also. In France, I talk to my neighbor who is a builder. He says, in schools where people learn to, to, to be craftsmen in building uh, five students, not 500 like we had before. So we go in the direction that for, for that reason and also for financial reasons, we'll, we will have to find new ways to construct. And so the idea of Habrak to make a, a kind of neutral basis on which you can build all kinds of topologies, which is also a separation of the, uh, you, you might say, the, um, the dirty ta task of building and the possible clean task of building by the introducing of in industrial uh, production means is one of the ways we could go. In, in this moment, I, I sit in a small group who talks with Habrak and of how we could uh, um, expand his, uh, uh, his website, um, uh, thematicdesign.org. Uh, and there is also a new website, which is about open building in the Netherlands. And you see many young architects uh, becoming interested in, in the question how we could uh, have a kind of open building uh, uh, architecture. And that is one of the, uh, the possibilities together with uh, uh, maybe using concrete, instead of concrete using wood for, because if you, if you use, wood, use wood, you could maybe construct a kind of uh, drager, a kind of supports, um, which, have, which have a free plan, or maybe you should still use concrete, but use wood for all the infill. I mean, we have to sort that out. The problem is that uh, builders are conservative. Um, some are of the investors in Holland, they, they build wood structures and wood uh, apartment buildings at the moment, but it's very architectural, very iconic. Um, so how could we make ordinary housing in a, in, in a modern production way and we use uh, the materials in such a way that we could recycle what we, uh, what we throw away and in the end uh, throw away less by making these uh, structures, these supports, which have a longer life. 
In most cases in Holland, the tradition is that we make a neighborhood and after 40 or 60 years, we tear it down, which is, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Nonsense. We should build better and for longer life. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Um, Nick, do you want to say something else? before? Well, if, if we I think we should probably end the formal part of the meeting, whether we can carry on, maybe you unrecord it and we keep on chatting because I'm, I'm certainly happy to chat some more. I think Richard and Johanna would. Um, but, uh, you know, there are other questions. I think uh, there's one suggestion. There's a PhD student here who uh, had not had the Dan Lee. Her question was about... Um, yeah, I did that read that. Picked up. That's okay. So that was Shan Shan saying we picked that up. So I feel that I feel we should end. I, I would like to thank Shud very much and our two panelists and for you for organizing this session, which I think is the last in this current series. And maybe you want to say a few words before the, the very end. But um, thank you very much um, from my point of view at any rate for arranging this uh, so efficiently, I may say. Okay, so um, I suppose that's a wrap for the 50 series. So I'm going to explain how it works for the next series shortly. So please stay with us. So, um, but first thing first, uh, I want to thank all the panelists today for your time and for your for sharing with us today um, your very insightful comments and for your interesting questions. So thank you, Nick. Um, thank you, Johanna and Richard for joining us today. And of course, massive thank you to the speaker, Short Suters for your terrific presentation. And please extend our thanks to Hester for helping with the presentation today. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so um, the new seminar series will kick off at the beginning of the Mikamas term, which will begin in October. And if you have any feedback or comments, we will be very grateful to hear them. So please email the questions or if you have any feedback or comments. And if you are interested in becoming our speakers, or if you would like to hear from someone or would like to nominate someone to be our speakers, please do get in touch. And until then, please have a look at our YouTube channel. There are a number of recordings of the past lectures available there. We will continue to upload more between now and October. And um, as we have now got an online presence, we would like to continue to enhance this, whether the Mikamas term will be um, in person or online. So more details will follow shortly. Um, it will be announced um, via email if you are on the mailing list. And if not, please keep an eye on our faculty website, which is arct.came.ac.uk. So um, further details will be announced once the pandemic situation becomes clearer. Um, until then, we hope everyone keeps safe and stay healthy. And thank you again for um, tuning in today and for your support throughout the virtual lecture series. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and one last thing. One one last thing for our uh, own students in our uh, in our department. Uh, actually, from the uh, the next term, Zhikai uh, and I may leave this uh, may leave this team, and we would like uh, to encourage our students be to join our team. Yeah, please contact us. Yeah, so um, thank you again, all the panelists and all the attendees today. Thank you for your questions and sorry we didn't have time to answer all of them. Thank you and bye for now. <laughs>